so I wanted to move on and, and talk about the, the philosophy of feudalism, uh, the, big, um, the big sort of way that philosophy was conceived of during this high medieval feudalistic time period. Um, because what we're interested in uh, primarily is the transition from feudalism to modernism which then eventually is capitalism, okay, but also the transition from feudalistic philosophy, uh, which is called scholasticism, to modern philosophy. Because again, with the philosophy of liberation in Enrique Dussel, he focuses a lot on, on, on this transition and, um, and wants again to see how the Latin American experience can help as we transition into a new sort of mode of culture, and, and that includes uh, a new, new way of philosophizing in the 21st century and beyond. And so uh, we want to look at these transitions and see what's going on. And, and Dussel has some interesting things to say about this that are, that are uh, uh, more sophisticated. Right now, we're focusing on kind of Marx, uh, and then Dussel kind of deconstructs Marx. So, so uh, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves there. But um, this is all laying the groundwork for, you know, getting to uh, the the philosophy of liberation and really understanding what that is uh, in this from this you know multicultural perspective in the 21st century. But all this history is is deeply woven into uh, the thinking here. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in the high medieval period, uh, what develops in the universities uh, that emerge, uh, as I was talking about in the last video, is, um, is scholasticism, um, and in particular, in its later phases, it becomes very Aristotelian, uh, meaning that it's super influenced by Aristotle. So the big, the big two Greek philosophers that sort of um, solidified the origins of what we consider philosophy, like in philosophy departments from a Western European perspective, the two big names are, are Plato and Aristotle. Plato wrote about Socrates and uh, was a student, a disciple of Socrates, but then Plato started a school, the academy. That's, that's where we get academics from. Uh, and then one of his students was Aristotle. And Aristotle became the tutor of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle, based upon his notoriety and being associated with Alexander, started his own school. Uh, and then, you know, so in, and these two schools, um, the Lyceum of Aristotle and the Academy of uh, Plato, uh, even after their deaths, continued on for, for, for several decades. And la this laid the groundwork for higher learning in the ancient, uh, ancient Europe, uh, the, in the waning days of the Greek Macedonian Empire and in the rise of the Roman Empire. Uh, and, and, and even today, you know, if you look at the curriculum for our philosophy department, a lot of it is based on Aristotle and Plato, you know, and, and uh, philosophy professors just never tire of going back to these authors. And in uh, medieval Europe, the University professors um, became well. The, one thing is that the the manuscripts, uh, the books, uh, were not as readily available, of course, as they are now. Everything had to be handwritten, hand copied, and there were lots of copies. Okay, but um, but during the kind of dark ages, as the Roman Empire was falling apart, um, a lot of monasteries were reusing paper, it wasn't really paper, but, um, but uh, parchment, which was made from animal skin, so it was very durable and 
reusable, so you know they're being environmentally conscious, no, but they're being uh, economically efficient uh, and reusing those resources. So they'd often scrape away like old text in order to write new, more contemporary stuff, which usually was some um, you know peculiar religious text um, that don't seem that valuable to us nowadays, but were way more value to, valuable to them than Plato was or, or Aristotle. And so some of the texts were lost that way, and some of the texts were just buried in, 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 in a monastery, just in some storeroom that nobody ever went into. And even if they had them on the shelf and they knew, oh, there's, there's Aristotle's work or there's Plato's work, they just never looked at them. You know, they just sat there on the shelf. Um, and, and so, for the most part, Plato was not studied that much. But more and more, Aristotle became popular. And by the, you know, the time of the Gothic cathedrals, and as they were having this, you know, sort of, um, sort of a higher standard of living, at least for the elites in Europe. And things are looking more orderly and universities are getting un underway and really getting established. Uh, by that time period, Aristotle became the philosopher. So for the scholastics, they just, call, when they spoke of the philosopher, um, they were talking about Aristotle. There's just no two ways about it. And, um, and now uh, I want to you know, show how, how Aristotle came to dominate scholasticism by way of Arabic philosophy. So with the caliphate and the rise of, of, of the caliphate, the Islamic empire, uh, and their establishment of universities in, a, in an earlier period, you know, that was, those universities were established in about the year 800 when Charlemagne was just beginning to get Europe in order. Um, so the, the Arabic speaking, so this is Islamic scholars who wrote in Arabic and spoke Arabic as their official, you know, uh, scholarly language. Um, they uh, they had like a, a few hundred years head start uh, and, and Aristotle became very important for them. And then European scholars just sort of uh, adopted a lot of what they developed uh, in those preceding centuries. So uh, let's see. So uh, for the Arabic philosophers, Speaking Arabic, not necessarily, they're not Arabs uh, ethnically, but they speak Arabic and they're international. As I showed before, the caliphate was huge uh, and multinational. Um, they referred to Aristotle as the first teacher. And of course, there's a, a second teacher later, uh, uh, but we'll get to that. 